everyone. Today I have with me author, publisher, editor, and professor Kathleen Rooney. Hi, Kathleen. Hi, thanks for having me. Oh, thank you for being on. I wanted to talk to you today about your new book, which is called Lillian Boxfish Takes a Walk. And I cannot tell you how much I love this book. (laughs) Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Oh, my goodness. I, you know, and I see that you are way younger than me. And as I'm reading this, I'm like, how is she doing this? How is she capturing the soul of this 84-year-old woman, like, so perfectly? And I'm only 52, so I'm not 84. But, you know, I was like, I felt like I was so in her brain. And the whole time I'm reading it, and I don't read, I don't do back covers, and I don't read reviews, and I don't, I yeah. just pick books that I want to read, okay? And when I got to the end and real, you know, because the whole time I'm like, this sounds like a real person. Like, this oh, woman God. could have been real. And I get to the back, and it's like, oh, duh, if she is a real person. I mean, face yeah. off, but still, like, it was just, it was crazy because that's what I kept thinking the whole time was, like, oh, and, of good. course, I'm like, glad. I want to know her, you know, like, I'm like, yes. I want to know her, you know, but I wanted to know, like, how did you do that? Like, how did you come across, you know, I want to hear your story about how you came across this woman and then based a book on her and, and you know, how that all came about. Yeah, so um, she is, you know, Lillian Boxfish, uh, who's my protagonist, is in fact based on a real woman whose name is Margaret Fishback, and I am very, very lucky to have this great best friend from high school named Angela, and she is the one who introduced me to the existence of Margaret Fishback, and she uh, was working towards her uh, library sciences degree down in Chapel Hill in North Carolina, and as part of that program, she had this internship at Duke University, which has this huge advertising archive. And keep in mind, I knew none of this and would know none of this, if not for Angela, but she got to be the archivist who processed Margaret Fishback's papers when her son mm. donated them. And so she was going through and noticing you know, that Margaret was a poet and the highest paid female advertising copywriter in America in the 30s, and this kind of, uh, you know, really outspoken, funny, proto-feminist figure. And so she called me up and said, I found someone who you would really like. And she was right. So I, um, long story short, got to go travel to this archive and do research there back in 2007. And I was the first non-librarian, non-archivist to work with her papers. And, you know, you're probably noticing that 2007 is 10 years ago. <laughs> that mm-hmm. was a long time ago. And so it took me that long to kind of figure out what I wanted to do with Margaret um, because I knew she was a fascinating figure. So I was like, do I, you know, want to try to do a biography? Do I want to try to reissue her books of poetry? You know, what am I going to do with her? And ultimately, I decided, you know, I'm not, I love biography, but I'm not a biographer. I'm not, you know, trained in that kind of objectivity and and truthfulness. And so I realized I needed to write it as fiction because I needed that freedom to just get really creative and imaginative and make stuff up. So, um, you know, as you'll probably, you know, mention or have noticed, you know, the book has that split structure where, of course, it's the past, which is heavily, heavily based on Margaret, but then the part, you know, set in 1984 mm-hmm. where she does this big 10-mile walk, pure invention, purely made up, and, you know, sadly, the real Margaret at, at that point would have been, um, you know, not able to do that kind of walk. She didn't, you know, she declined <laughs> faster than her fictional counterpart, and so, you know, that was the part where I just got to totally, um, you know, go into my own imaginings and, and let that character do what I wanted. Oh, and what a great concept. I mean, and, and I, you know, of course, I'm a reader, right? And yes. as, as when I pick up these different books, I always look for that something that I'm going to love about it. And what I loved about this book was how you seamlessly put us back and forth. Like, I was there. I was, like, in the 30s with her, and then I was back in the 80s with her. And, okay. you know, I, I loved how in the, on the back of the book how you did her walk, you know, her yes, fictional yes, walk. Map. Because I, I go to, I'm in Pennsylvania, I go to New York City quite often, and so it was, like, fun to see that it was actual, you know, like, you could actually trace it on a map of where she was, and, and but her story, like, I, I've been doing it so weird because, you know, yesterday was National Women's Day, I've been doing these yeah. books on these strong women, and what I love is that 
when I thought it was just fiction, but now finding out that it wasn't all fiction, is that there were these women. Like, yeah. there were these women back in the 30s who were paving the way, who were doing, like, what she did in the 30s. Like, people didn't hear about that. And now with your book, like, they can hear, like, see, there were women in the work industry, and they were out there, and they were, you know, and she, she was the top female paid, but she tried to be the top. Right. Yeah. Like she was. She yeah. Asked for raises to get to be. She thought she deserved it. She thought, why do I have to be the top female? When, right. Exactly. You know, I'm so good. Right. Yeah. Well, and that's you know I'm so glad that that resonated with you because I you know I think I love you know all fiction but I think especially with historical fiction you know the kind of historical mm-hmm. fiction that I hope to write and that I like to read is is you know naturally the stuff that seems to have that resonance with our current moment and so you know that's one of the things I liked about Margaret and that I tried to show with Lillian and I think you know another thing that I sort of wanted to do is exactly what you're saying point out you know I know everybody knows Mad Men and it's a great show and it's a lot of fun but it is that hyper masculine world and I think we Mm. forget or just don't know that prior to that there was this hugely hugely female world of advertising where they were the ones revolutionizing stuff. And, and one of the things I do with Lillian is show um, how she and her real-life counterpart, Margaret, really kind of introduced comedy and humor to advertising, which seems nuts because nowadays so many ads, you know, try to be funny. They, they might not succeed, but they at least try. And, you know, before Margaret's innovation, there was this idea that, you know, you shouldn't make fun of a product because you're asking people to part with their hard-earned money and they're going to feel insulted if you make fun of what they're spending it on, you know, and so Margaret really said, hey, we can, you know, gently make fun of it and draw people in and and get them to buy stuff or get them to know about our products with comedy without making them feel like we're insulting their intelligence. And I think, you know, that's just so, especially, you know, there's this, um, you know, stereotype perpetuated by people like, you know, Christopher Hitchens and others that, like, women aren't funny, which I find preposterous. <laughs> so <laughs> I like to show that, actually, they're really funny. And, you know, Lillian slash Margaret basically, um, you know, paved the way, you know, not just for careers, but for this whole style and attitude. Yes. And um, I have to tell you that, so I bought the hardcover, right? And then yeah. I had to drive. So I bought the audio because I wanted oh, to get you on. <gasps> and who did the audio? I mean, that yeah. was just crazy it was so good I think it really helped me with going into her character the woman was brilliant yeah yeah that was um Exe Sands is her name and her name her first name is Xe just spelled with the letter X and the letter E and you say it Xe mm-hmm. and her last name is Sands and yeah she's phenomenal they um my publisher just you know approached me and said hey we've got this person that we think uh would be great at doing Lillian and they sent me some clips and I was instantly Um, completely captivated her voice is fantastic and she does Mm. the voices and um, also I don't know if you listened at the end of the audiobook but there's that um, Q&A that we do and I think uh, what I think of Exy is what I think of sort of great singers like um, you know Billie Holiday or Betty LeVette who you know okay so they didn't write the songs but the way that they interpret the songs is so beautiful and I think Exy does that she's not just somebody who you know, reads the word off the page, she really gets in there and thinks, okay, what's my motivation? Who is this character? How am I going to embody this? And I just, I, I think she's such a good reader and so smart about how she reads. Oh, and, you know, the way that she said the names, the Italian names, I was yeah. like, it was so beautiful, like, and, and kind of, like, took on the man and then that kind of accent, and, yes. you know, she was like, I've listened to a lot of audiobooks, and so I'm kind of picky about who I listen to, and right. hers was just done. I, I was like, wow, she is good. Like, I'd listen yeah. to her read anytime. A lot of times I fast-forward them, too, yeah. because I want to hear more, and I couldn't with sure. her. I was like, I right, know, exactly. I want to hear it in her voice. Like, I don't want to hear that fast-forward voice. Totally, you know? so, totally, same thing. You know, it, it really enhances the book. And, and, you know, when you were saying that it took, like, you know, because 2007 and 2017, what I think yeah. about that is, like, isn't it crazy how the timing, like, in 2007, I don't know that people would have paid attention as much to what, what she's about. And I think the timing of this book is also so important because – our daughters and, and are, you know, wanting to see these strong women figures. And I, I really think that that's part of the beauty of this 
book is to show this woman who was strong and yet she was a mom and she was, you know, a wife. And, yeah. and, and, and of course, you know, how she always said she wasn't going to be, uh, was that part of Margaret? Like that she didn't really want to be um, yeah. you know, that stereotype. But then she ends up falling in love, like, you know, instantly. And she's like, I'm against this. I, I wrote about this. I'm against falling in love on first sight, you know, but then it, yeah. it goes and happens to her, you know? Yeah. And I, I'm so glad you like that. And I, I agree. And I think, you know, that's, um, um, one of the things that appealed to me, too, about the real-life figure and that I definitely wanted to capture was, um, you know, with this, you know, in addition to being an advertising copywriter, she was a very successful light-verse poet writing these kind of very rhyming and metered Dorothy Parker-esque witty droll verses. And that was one of her great topics was, oh, I'm a career woman and I'm making all this money. How would I ever get married? And then, of course, naturally, right, um, <laughs> you know, pride goes before the fall. She, of course, you know, did fall in love at first sight. Um, and so I thought that was fascinating. And then another thing, you know, I wanted to jump off that, and and this gets into more of the, um, the 1984 section. You know, in addition to the, the strong female figure from the past, I wanted to show – how in 1984, this this woman who was so um, extroverted and curious might age and might be in a mm. city that's sort of falling apart and that a lot of people are scared of and mm-hmm. leaving. They're fearful of strangers. They don't want to talk to people who are different than themselves. And so how could I show this woman, you know, as an octogenarian but still wanting to connect to people? And I think that's another thing, you know, just now in, in 2017, I think we just really need to – you know, have that empathy and talk to people and, and not be so fearful of, of people who are mm-hmm. different. Absolutely. And you, I mean, the way you wrote the 1980s, because I'm not sure you were actually alive during that. <laughs> yeah, I was only <laughs> four, though, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I mean, and I was. Most of it. I was, so I thought that you captured that so perfectly. You know, that whole sense of how, I mean, New York City was scary, back then you know people did look at yeah. it as a scary place and and when I realized how young you were I was like wow she first of all let me just tell you you're writing and you know that when I found out that you were a poet I was not surprised it is poetic your writing is beautiful every sentence is beautiful and I just enjoyed it so much Thank so I just you. want to tell you that before you know because at first when I started reading it, too, I'm thinking, okay, so she liked Mad Men, you know? Like, yeah. And then I find out, well, she was like one of the original. She was before. This woman was yeah. before Mad Men, okay? You know? Yeah. Like they should have been using her as their example, you know? Right, right, yeah. And, I mean, everybody loves Peggy and what's not to love. But, you know, before there was Peggy, there was, you know, Margaret. That's Schreck, right. So. I, w- I wouldn't be surprised if um, Matthew Weiner didn't know, you know? Yeah, he's yeah. Aware. He's a smart yeah, man, so. Yeah, she's in the research, so probably. Yeah, I would say. So, okay, let me just talk about you now. Like, okay, I was was looking, because I always like to find these fun, like, facts about the people that I interview. And um, when I started doing this, I used to tell everybody that I wanted to be the Oprah of YouTube because I loved Oprah's book club. So much when that was my age, you know, of when I was at home raising my kids, yeah. and and but I used to get upset that it was one book a month, okay? Yeah. Because I'm a reader. I'm like a book right. a month. I'm doing a book every other day. Like it's totally. Just, it was like a ridiculous concept, right? So when I started this, I'm like, I'm going to be the Oprah of YouTube, and I'm going to read all these books and interview the authors, and and then I find out you wrote a book back in yeah. 2005 called Reading with Oprah. So I wanted to hear of, like, what happened with that. Like, how did you get that concept for that? Yeah, yeah. Because, so, again, you were young, you know. And- right, yeah, yeah. I, I love that connection. And, I, you know, I really I really admire what Oprah did and, and, you know, still continues to do periodically for literature. And so the mm-hmm. way that I sort of got that on my radar was I worked as a bookseller. And so I was young, but, you know, at the very end of um, – high school and then the, you know, throughout my undergraduate years, I worked at um, a set of bookstores that are here. They're like a local chain, very small, just three three locations in Chicagoland called Anderson's Books. Mm-hmm. And they're, um, the big store is in Naperville. They've got one in Downers Grove. Um, and those were the two I worked at. And so, of course, working as a bookseller um, in the late 90s and early 2000s, you just could not miss the massive influence that Oprah had on the literary industry. And so, I was fascinated by it, by just sort of this idea of... Wouldn't it become number one, like, instantly? Yeah, instantly. And then it would be number one, right? Yeah, crazy. And not just number one, but, like, you know, head and shoulders above the rest, like, runaway bestseller, um, Mm -hmm. you know, by thousands of copies. And so, yeah, her her influence was amazing. And so 
I was super fascinated by how this, you know, like televised figure was taking the printed page and making it work on TV because, you know, if you read the book or if you, you know, do, do any looking into it, all of Oprah's producers and people told her don't do it, you know, books are death on TV, you can't make it work and not mm. get killed in the ratings and blah, blah, blah. So long story short, I just admired the tenacity of her to say, you know what, I'm a reader, I love it, I know it's going to be hard, but I'm going to make this thing that I love work on TV. And I was also fascinated by the way that there was so much, um, so much love for it, but also so much hate kind of from... I guess, you know, elite people or people who fancied themselves experts. You know, there was, of course, the famous Jonathan Franzen thing. And I thought it was just, it was a really mm. interesting touchstone for looking at how people read and looking at the difference. You know, I'm a professor. I'm in the academy. I love it. I love the deep reading we do in class, but I also think it's a mistake to dismiss all the thousands of people who read just for fun, who are also equally smart readers, but might approach it in a different way. And so I thought Oprah was like a great opportunity to look at that phenomenon yeah and I, I that's the other thing that I always thought about it was when like I said first of all she's doing one book a month right right but then when I saw what she was doing for those authors that yeah. nobody knew of because she didn't pick you know she didn't pick the number one bestseller on New York right. Times she would go after a deeper book, you know, the one that, that maybe somebody didn't see in a bookstore, and she would read it. And I'm sure she read tons of books until she found one that she wanted to do. But it was never one of your, like, mainstream writers. It was always just somebody. And then what she did for their life was she yeah. – it, it turned their world upside down, you know, yeah. because they became – they went from, you know, one day they're writing this cute little book to the next day, you know, they're op on Oprah's show and, and everybody in the – you know, that's watching Oprah is reading their book, which is, you know, more than they could have ever had hoped for, right? I right. mean, more books than, and that and that was what I was thinking. I mean, I've been saying that over and over again. I was like, I want to make these authors that maybe somebody else doesn't know about, you know, and bring them to the front. Of yeah. course, I don't, I'm not Oprah because I don't have books to follow. Well, but, no, but it's, but it was it's a great thing to do, yeah. It was definitely my way of thinking because I saw that she changed their life. And it was yes. like, how awesome to take authors where, like you said, a lot of people were like, oh, nobody cares, nobody cares. But actually, people do care. Yeah. And I, I have found that that is not true because I know now from talking to people, like, they do care. And they want to hear how books are written. And they have questions. And she got to ask them the questions that everybody else was thinking when they were reading the books. It was awesome. It was what yeah. a concept. You know? Yeah. And, and I think, I mean, you know, what she did and what, you know, people like you do is so valuable because – you know, as you probably know from, from being a reader and talking to other readers, is that that word of mouth recommendation is golden, right? You can, you know, mm -hmm. if you want, you can read reviews, you could read the back jackets, and, you know, that's a fine thing to do. But when somebody you know and trust and kind of have a sense of their opinions and their taste says, hey, check out this author, um, you know, you're probably going to do it. So it really, it really does make a difference to, to writers. So <laughs> yeah, I really, yeah, I really think that I just think that, and I'm not an Amazon review per, like I told you before, yeah. I don't, I don't read the back. I don't go because sometimes those Amazon reviews are paid and they're, you know, I right. just think yeah. like, I don't even, I don't even care. I pick topics that I think I'm going to like, and that's where I go after. And but, yeah, I really wanted to, to showcase it. So it's like when I saw that about you, I'm like, no way. Like, no way yeah. to write a book Funny about Oprah yeah. when, I've been, you know, when I've been saying that. So, yeah. okay, so, before, so as we wrap this up, um, what are you doing next? Because I, I really I can't wait to hear what, what you're working on. Yeah, yeah. So I, I have a couple projects that are sort of in progress. And the, the first one I hope will be um, a new novel, and it's, Currently, the working title is An Instinct, and it's about um, – it's historical fiction again, and so it's about World War One, and it sort of mm. has a split structure. Yeah, I love World War One. I. I think it's a fascinating war. It's so sad. Yeah. It was the war to end all wars, and now, 100 years later, most people don't know anything about it. Right. And so many people died, and it changed the world, and, you know, it gets overshadowed, understandably, by World War Two, but it, it set the groundwork for World War Two. So I'm writing from the perspective of um, – a World War II or a World War One soldier, this guy Charles Whittlesey, who was a super famous war hero, 
um, but who had, you know, kind of a tragic ending, not to give too much away. And then um, from the perspective of a messenger pigeon, um, so I'm writing from the first person perspective of a pigeon, which I hope doesn't sound too crazy, um, but she was a hero too. She saved this group of soldiers called the Lost Battalion. Um, they were trapped by the Germans. They were under friendly fire. And so she was the one who took the message um, back to headquarters that said, stop, <laughs> you know, we're Americans, stop shelling us, you're killing your own guys. Um, and she too became so famous in the 20s and 30s, um, and she's even stuffed and in the Smithsonian, but nobody nobody knows wow. who she was. <laughs> so I want to point out this. I just think they were both such um, oh, that's heroic crazy. figures. Yeah, so I want yeah. to share them yeah. with the world. Oh, that's awesome. I, and I Thanks. love historical fiction. I mean, I, I'm a, I, I love novels, but I love when it, like, has a story, you know, behind yeah, it. Yeah, me too. And, me too. And, you know, more and more people are doing that. There's so many stories out there. I mean, it's a never-ending thing. There's yeah. stories out there everywhere. We will never run out. It is we will never run out of stories. Exactly. Yeah. So you have your own website, which is beautiful, and I will put the Thank link you. on this video for everybody who wants to go on there. But where else can people find you? Um, yeah, you know, what are your I, other – yeah, yeah. So I, um, I'm really active on Twitter. I like um, Twitter, like literary Twitter. I think it's fun. I have a lot of, you know, fun oh, good. that I like to see there. So my handle is Kathleen M as in Marie, which is my middle name, Rumi. Um, so it's just my my name and my middle initial. So people can um, find me there, and I try to be fun and not too self promotional. Um, and then I'm also, uh, you know, because that's a thing. Um, I, know. I have a, a Tumblr um, for this group that I'm part of. This. Um, poetry collective based in Chicago called Poems While You Wait. So if you just go to the to poemswhileyouwait.tumblr.com and um, just a little bit about that before we um, wrap up, it's sort of this thing where we, uh, all of us are poets, we take our typewriters, manual typewriters, no electricity, um, to a public place like a museum or a library or a street festival. Um, like next week we're going to the Adler Planetarium, and for $5 a poem people can come up and say, write me a poem on this topic. So, you know, at the planetarium, people will probably say, write me a poem about the moon, and we'll do it. So um, people should check that it out. That is crazy. That is awesome. And you are an amazing, I mean, you know, I just want people to know, like, you're an amazing poet. You're not just uh, a writer. You know, you're not just a novelist. Yeah, thank you. An thank you, yeah. Poet. And you can yep, tell that in the, the book genres. because I can, add, I can see where you added your poetry, and, you know, yes. it, was, it was crazy. But that is such a cool concept. I love that. Yeah, and yeah. So if people are curious, they can um, if they just go to that Tumblr. You know, we uh, there's like 22 of us, and so we rotate through, and you know, you can check out all of our all of our poetry and all the other poets I do it with are awesome. So shout out oh, to them too. And you know what? Let's keep the poetry going because I think it's a lost. I don't know in school that they that kids get taught how awesome poetry is like yeah. we did. You know, not nearly like, enough. Not nearly enough. So I, that's a, another thing to have an appreciation for is, you know, and that they can come up to you on the spot, like, and you can come up yes. with a poem. That's just awesome. So thank you. everybody thank you, check thank out you. that, and I will add all your links. I will make sure to do that. And um, I can't wait. I hope you come back on here for your next book because I really yes. want to hear about it. Awesome. I and know. Then we can, and then we can <laughs> tell everybody. So, I'll, okay, well, thank you so much, Kathleen. You have a great yes. day. Thank you, Michelle. You too. I really appreciate it. Thanks for all your hard work okay. and all your promotion of literature. <laughs> okay. Good luck with your next book. We'll talk okay, to you Okay. Bye-bye.